What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. This right here is going to be a very important video. This project that I'm about to speak on is one of the more ambitious and exciting games I've seen in a while, probably since I got into doing this at all. A true hardcore tactical first person shooter, a game which seems to have very little shortcuts, handouts, easy systems to assist you, etc. I know a lot of people talk about quality of life, and that's not what I'm talking about here. Every game that I've played over the last 24 months, besides Tarkov, really does not capture that fear, that gripping high risk, high reward gameplay. But this title, I believe without a shadow of a doubt, is going to do that. The game that I'm referring to is called We The People. It's a hardcore tactical shooter set in a post-apocalyptic America, but really the Pacific Northwest in the year 2028. It does seem to be taking a more hardcore Tarkov style minimal HUD that has a PVP risk focus with PVE elements, zombies, a DayZ type of feel. One of my good friends, Chi Yeti, a legend and a manager in the Caliber Collective. Make sure you join that now. It's in the description below. Has recently supported their Patreon and really looked at their project, so I'm getting a lot of information from him. And I've also interviewed one of the lead developers, Drew. But before I go into that, I want to talk a little bit about the game. The game's going to have vendors, PvP, open world, stash. You can trade with each other, quest, you can deploy. And then there's going to be a safe settlement. There's not going to be any menu where you, when you go out into the world, you're risking everything on you. This has been one of my primary complaints with Grey Zone. I think Grey Zone Warfare has a great idea, but the finality and the risk of death doesn't set in like it does in Escape from Tarkov. And then hopefully this game. And that high risk, high reward, securing a kill, getting the loot from that player is why I play these games. It is that intensity, that gamble, that adrenaline pumping interaction with another player to know if they're gonna be friendly or shoot you, things like that. And the more I talk to people, the more I realize they're kind of in the same boat with that. There are people who like the arcade style, the quick loops, the refreshed raids, TikTok swiping very fast, play, play, play all the time, games. And I do too, man. There's a time for arcade experiences and true competitive gameplay. But in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, Escape from Tarkov is still king of this genre, and I don't see anything even remotely close to number two yet. But in my honest opinion, whatever does come to number two or eventually setting a new bar, they're going to have to be hardcore, brutal, scary and have high risk high reward systems to engage and hook that player into the interaction with the ai the interaction with the other players and i am hopeful from everything that i have seen and know about the game that we the people can do that so let's hop into the interview this was just via dms he answered a lot of questions that the caliber collective had one of the first questions was monetization we were asking if there's going to be different additions for the game and what will that entail Drew responded with, yes, we will have bundles. It would be pretty standard compared to most games in the genre. Ideally, we will try to get creative in order to avoid pseudo pay to win feeling found in some bundles with similar games in the genre. Quote unquote, we fucking hate pay to win, which is good. You know, a lot of these games have the bundles where you can have a bigger stash, more starter gear, things like that. And that is, you know, it's a form of pay to win. My only argument with a true pay to win system is at least that's capped. I cannot keep spending money to, you know, during the course of the game, get more gear or things like that. I have to be good at the game and, you know, loot and things like that. So yes, there is some pay to win elements with that, having a bigger stash and more weapons and whatnot, but it's capped. So I can deal with that. And I think most people agree with that. The second question was, are there any sort of unwinding mechanics that you are working on that are not part of the core loop, such as fishing? What we wanted to really ask here, is there any type of survival mechanisms or things you can do in the world that isn't necessarily go in, fight, extract? We want to see if there's any type of depth that they're trying to attack here with creating a real living, breathing world that you can interact with. And Drew's response was definitely yes to the unwinding mechanics like fishing. We feel this is an opportunity to make our settlement a lot more meaningful and engaging than most games in the genre. A lot of these mechanics will be tied to a form of global progression among the entirety of the player base. More info on that to come soon. One thing with these titles is as much depth as they put into the core loop, which is obviously the most important thing, it is fun to see other things that you can do, whether it's in a hideout system, and in, in this case, a settlement system, not so much at a screen or a menu. And I think that's a really cool idea and more games should go for that. It creates an idea of immersion and a true connection to the world you're playing in. 
Next question we asked was what sort of PID or friendly indicators will there be in your game? This has been a big one for us and you know, we usually play in larger groups. I think that's, you know, with gaming for me and, and many people in the CC, we game for the social aspect of it. We like playing together. We, we enjoy good, good communication, larger groups, and we need a good PID system. You know, just something, make it realistic. It doesn't have to be a little icon above their head and whatnot, but communication can only go so far. And a little something, I really like beautiful light system with the chem lights on the back, but a little something to give you an idea that that is a friendly. Drew's response was, we're looking at a variety of things, but essentially it would come down to what game mode you're referring to. Be closer to games like EFT or Grey Zone Warfare, though we are also looking at how games like Arena Breakout handles it and considering the sentiments feedback they are getting in as a result. But because our game has less of a focus on different player factions, we view PID systems a little differently. Things like IR patches, for example, could be useful in this instance. We'd prefer to have that more hardcore and unforgiving approach requiring communication among squad mates. Though having your PDA slash map out would likely indicate where your teammates are, we will be testing a variety of options, potentially bringing them into play tests alongside polls for feedback from the broader community. Oh, and I forgot to mention they're going to have an arena mode. I'm not sure exactly what that entails, but he also said, as far as our arena mode, we might lean more into a simple, less hardcore PID perspective to allow for the focus to be on competitive and objective play. So the fact that they're putting a lot of care into that makes me hopeful, but we didn't get a clear direct answer of exactly what their PID system is going to be because they haven't really designed it yet. But I'm glad that they're looking at that as an important factor because it is. So I asked him because I really wanted him to know this because it really tells you you know, what type of game you're looking at here. I asked him how many people are gonna be on a server, how many players? And he said, we gotta keep that locked down for now, but we're planning on discussing that sort of thing this year. Next question I asked was, as far as looting, will there be a lot of it? Will there be extras for crafting outside or just basic survival or will it be minimal? His answer was a good one because I believe in these types of games, you have to have a lot of loot and you know, it increases the stakes that you're playing for each time you go into a raid. He said, loot will be a major part of the game and there should be a lot of it. I love that. So closer to something like EFT where loot is very integral over something like GZW where loot is not very integral. We want loot to be meaningful and inventory stash management to be very important. This also significantly plays into the pacing of a wipe and individual slash global progression. Starting the wipe with access to lower tier guns, more akin to older historical firearms like the M1 with limited customization early on, for example, will naturally create and emphasize the value slash excitement in finding something tactical like an M4 or more modern weapon capable of a lot more customization. That is probably one of the best answers that I have in this little interview uh, that's very important and I was ecstatic to see the approach they're taking with that. The next question I asked, what does trading look like, if any? You'll be able to trade with vendors, which should be relatively self-explanatory. We'd also like players to be able to trade amongst themselves in the settlement via the auction house. We may also allow players to trade to one another individually in person, but we'll be looking into setting up guardrails and testing its limitations to prevent real money trading before we push this sort of thing out. This would be entirely separate from our one-to-one -one dual concept, which is not supposed to be a form of trading, but rather staking. And the reference he gave was old school uh, RuneScape. So I think that would be really cool to have that one-on-one -on -one capability to duel and, and things like that. That's a very unique system that I haven't seen in these types of titles yet. So then I asked him about release. What's your current timeline for release? He answered, ideally we'd like to release EA this year. And although we've been curtailed due to the multiplayer system refactors, it's still possible. However, we're also not exactly in a rush to push it out until it's ready and worthy of people's time and investment. We've seen far too many games released prematurely in recent memory and we'd like to avoid those pitfalls, ensuring our first impression with the FPS community is a good one. Conversely, that would just allow for more time and opportunities to play test the game prior to its global release. Also, it's worth considering that we'll have both non-NDA closed play tests available as well as open play tests prior to early release, so people will have a clear understanding of what they're getting themselves into ahead of time. So, I probably should have led with this guys this interview and these questions i actually asked drew in june and here we are in october with no early access information things like that so it's not going to be more than likely coming this year which is good but i'll see if i can look into getting more of an answer in the future but in my opinion they need to take as much time as they need there is no rush with this type of stuff because they have a very good idea i mean a solid idea they don't need to botch it without making sure their game is ready
So I asked him about maps. How many total maps will be in your game at launch and what are the sizes? Before I get into this answer, one of the things that really struck me about this game was the verticality of his images. In a lot of these games, you have like little baby hills and you don't have true vertical playing when it comes to especially the Pacific Northwest. And it seems like they're trying to capture that. So I thought that looked really good. His answer with the, the map question, we would like five extract maps to be available at EA launch. The amount of arena maps is yet undetermined. As to the size, we'd like large, massive maps so one map could be larger than all EFT maps combined where others could be small medium size using that same metric. They had a devlog where they talk about macro and micro map creation where they talk about wanting to create larger scale maps over time. Again, this is a good thing for this type of title, and I hope they succeed in doing it. It's very important. Next question I asked was, what would you gauge your PvE to PvP ratio to be? This has always been very important to me because I personally like PvP with the, you know, tiny threat or moderate threat of a PvE interaction while you are fighting those other players. His answer was, I'd say in extraction mode, you'd be looking at 60% PvP, 40% PvE. That is huge huge. That's wild. I'm very excited for that. He did go on and say, however, we're considering some layered on dynamic systems and concepts inspired by games like Helldivers 2 or other MMORPGs that would probably shake up the more traditional PvE loop you might find in games in the genre. And the last thing I asked him was if he wanted to share anything else about his game that I didn't ask. His response was, as we closely approach our one year mark of being in the public face, Having showed the We The People Tech demo at the latest Steam Fest, it's important to remind everyone that we are a small team of people who care about games and gaming, not a major studio, not even a small or medium sized studio. We have a handful of people who decided to dedicate the last year to bring our ideas to life and slowly create something badass. We are taking on real giants in the industry with a fraction of the resources, so these things take time. But it also means we have less red tape preventing us from trying new things or thinking outside the box. We had a few opportunities to sell out last year. At the cost of our creativity and integrity, we chose not to. Another important thing to note is we don't want to go the route of ABI just trying to make another clone of Tarkov. Although we are initially received and compared to games like Escape from Tarkov, we have some unique ideas and things we'd like to bring to the genre that we think will help the white pacing slash longevity significantly and differentiate us from our peers in the genre. I'm not a developer. I would like to help maybe, you know, publish some games in the future, but that last statement by him was very crucial and I want to support their game as much as I can. Having the opportunity to sell themselves to another developer and turning it down so they can focus on their creativity and reason why they started is a Chad move to me. I think that's uh, it's honorable and their vision is insane. I'm actually going to be making quite a few more We The People videos because I'm going to be honest, guys, this this title is looking like mine and, and many others potential main title in the future. The, the things that they are setting up is a lot of things that we're looking for when it comes to this genre. I hope to be more involved. I hope this video gets good reception and the developers are pleased with it. This is not an advertisement. I was not incentivized in any way to make this video. I'm just very passionate about this genre in general. And I think We The People have a great opportunity to compete in it. So let me know what you think, guys. If you have any questions, I'm also gonna link their website and their Patreon down below. They are, they are fully funded by Patreon supporters. It's a very different approach on game development and I'm here for it. I think it's important. A true indie passion project where they can set their own rules, their own pacing and listen to people like us. So go give them some support and also join their Discord. And if you enjoyed the video, you know what to do. I will catch you guys on the next one. Thank you.